John Lark, I'm from Kangaroo Island Spirits. My wife Sarah and I decided uh, that we'd like to make gin um, back in about 2002 at our wedding. Uh, we were talking to my brother Bill Lark, who some of you may know of, who was the godfather of the whiskey industry in Tasmania. And for 10 years prior to our wedding, he had uh, been helping to support the growth of a new industry in Tasmania. And um, on the day of our wedding, I imbibed a little Dutch courage. I had a gin and tonic with my um, great-grandmother-in-law uh, before the wedding. So uh, I was thinking about gin and we liked gin. And in talking to my brother, it um, became apparent that uh, while some of the whisky guys in Tasmania were making gin, none of them were doing it with love. They were using it as a cash flow, using, making it with oils. And, uh, and Sarah and I started to develop the idea of wanting to make gin the traditional way with traditional processes. And I guess the idea was born from there. Okay, um, we ended up getting our licence in 2006 for what became Australia's first craft gin distillery with a focus on gin. We also decided to think about some liqueurs um, and to develop a concept based around a term that we hijacked, if you like, in, in, uh, in, in slow spirits. We derived the concept from slow food and brought it across to try and describe the craft that we were wanting to develop with, with gin in Australia um, by making small batch gins using local ingredients. Okay, um, the business um, had, uh, well, Kangaroo Island seemed, uh, we weren't on Kangaroo Island at the time, but uh, we more or less had an idea in, in, from the city and went and looked for a region to put it in. Kangaroo Island seemed the obvious choice. Um, it had an emerging food and wine industry. It had a fairly strong tourism base. Um, and it was also fairly remote, which suited Sarah and I because we had a background in living remote. So we were able to get out of the city and, and be not too far away from the market, but live remote and leverage off the existing fantastic values of Kangaroo Island. So we went to the island in um, 2003 or four and, and we bought this property. Um, location, location, location. We bought a property on the main highway out of Kingscote, which ensured that just about every visitor to the island had to drive past our property. It had what we needed. It had an old farmhouse and it had an old shed and it had very basic utilities in terms of limited power and water, but enough to get us started. We had an idea. Okay. Um, With the growing tourism industry on, Tas on Kangaroo Island, it gave us the opportunity to open a small cellar door with a distillery and the whole concept of our business and the character was a very organic process in terms of people coming to see. We had a very small 80 litre pot still which we use to this day and people came into our shed and often sort of um, described the experience as, as, as if they were driving into our backyard which essentially they were and sometimes even imagined banjos playing in the background. Okay, so there's a picture of Sarah and I and the small still. So as I said before, no one in Australia was making gin properly in those days. Um, you either made it, you know, my brother and his mates in Tassie said, don't make gin, make whiskey. We ignored that because we liked gin. Because I also recognised that whiskey is really essentially just beer that's been distilled and there's no art or craft in it at all. If you think about gin, it's quite an artistic process. You have your traditional botanicals and you need to, to balance the flavours and you can do a lot more with it. So we took a very London style gin concept and um, tried to marry into that local processes and local botanicals. Um, we were very lucky in our early days to receive the support of the South Australian Food and Beverage Development Fund grant and we went to Europe and we spent some time in Italy, Germany, um, ten, 10 days in, a, in a, um, a Swedish distillery and then on to the UK for a bit of a look over there. Because back then and even still today, it's very difficult to learn the art of making gin in Australia. Okay, then we acquired this little still, the 80 litre pot still you can see on our right there. And um, we went about spending 12 to 18 months trying to develop the process for that still to make gin. We tried putting botanicals in the pot and making gins like Gordon's and Plymouth where they stew the botanicals. And eventually we derived, we had to come up with a better way. We found that the gins were too oily and we went for a, a vaporisation method which involved a very elaborate basket in the neck of the still. So we went to Chinatown and we bought a sieve for about two bucks and we whacked it in the neck of the still and hung the botanicals in it and our first gin was born. Um, our Kangaroo Island wild gin has been around for, for 10 years now and has won awards in London, New York, San Francisco, Hong Kong and in Australia, pulling a silver medal this year in Melbourne. So amazingly, I look at that still today and think that we've grown our business to where it is 
uh, producing 60 bottles of gin at a time, sometimes two runs a day. But thankfully in the next fortnight we're installing a second still and we'll be able to start to scale up and, and one day have a day off. So as I said, integral to the innovation of our products was adding, you know, drawing the character of Kangaroo Island into our, our, our gins. And we started to, to discover um, local botanicals such as, as this one here, which is referred to as Bubiala or native juniper, is in fact a myoporum. It's not a true juniper, but you can under we could understand why the locals referred to it as such. It's a small purple berry, similar in size to a juniper berry, and it has some similar characteristics in flavour. Nothing else. It's not, not a pine tree, so it's not related. So we paired this up with common juniper because gin must have juniper to be gin um, and a range of other traditional botanicals and, um, and the wild gin was born. More recently, about two or three years ago, we began experimenting with this plant, Oleria axillaris coastal daisy bush. Um, like a lot of things to do with our business, it's got a great story. It was first described by the early Dutch explorers on the West Australian coast in about 1690. There are records of them actually eating this plant. So it, it's possibly one of the first plants that, that Western visitors to Australia incorporated into their diet. Um, sometimes called wild rosemary because of its appearance, it has a sweet, almost passion fruity flavour to it in its style. And um, it married very well with juniper as well. And we decided to make a more savoury gin with this. We balanced it with local Riverland oranges and um, some, uh, some Asian peppers to make it more savoury. And the O-Gin went on to, um, about 18 months ago, being described as Australia's best botanical gin by gourmet traveller Max Allen. So we're very pleased with that. These are just some of the traditional spices that we add, um, citrus peel, juniper, um, exotic peppers and coriander seed. Okay, other than... Um, the, the two that I just mentioned, Oleria and uh, the Bubiala, we also use as much local ingredients as we can. We've um, won, made an award-winning anisette liqueur, which was featured at the Origins Dinner this year during Tasting Australia, made from wild fennel that we collected on the side of the roads. We make a wonderful limoncello with local lemons, and we make a range of other liqueurs, um, Zenzerino, a Nocino, which is an Italian green walnut liqueur. And where possible, we use local ingredients to do that. Okay, so our success. After 10 years, we've, um, as I said, we've started to get some very strong recognition, both domestically and internationally. Um, we, uh, earlier on in about 2009, we managed to win an, an award for innovation in the regional awards. And more recently, we won the Small Business Award in our region twice. Um, the medals you can see are for the International Spirits Competitions, for our vodka, the Anisette and Zenzerino. Um, I guess if you wanted to, wanted to sum up the reasons of our success, it's, it's about creating links in the region, region to processes, to characters and to stories. Um, we're never short of a story at our place. And if you've been to our cellar door, you'll see that it has lots of character. Um, it's certainly really important to us that Kangaroo Island has so much to offer, but it's small businesses that look like us that add a bit of character and personality to the regions. Um, it's not so easy being a small business person that I, and the, the, the first speaker this morning talking about entrepreneurship, he was, he was quite right in our case, there was no such thing as having money. It was about having a, a crazy good idea and running with it. Um, the other thing, of course, is being open all year. For us on the island, it, it is a bit of a struggle at times, but it has definitely been worthwhile for us to be open all year. Fortunately, in our business, we can do other jobs and be around the steel and be looking at markets off island and still have the cellar door open seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, we have good coffee, pretty essential and very hard to find in a lot of regional places, but brings a lot of people in. It keeps us going. Um, quality of product and experiences. We also, uh, in the last few years, have realised that with the growing numbers in our cellar door, and we've seen extraordinary growth in the last few years, doubling and tripling of numbers coming through and the increase of international visitors that we needed to find other products. People travelling overseas, it wasn't so easy for them to shove bottles into their suitcase and take them away. So we needed to um, add on to the experiences that we we're offering as, as a general part of our visit to develop some experiential products. Um, with that in mind, we developed a range of masterclasses teaching people about how gin is made, allowing people to make their own gin and talking about the history of gin. 
We've planted a, an extensive gin garden full of aromatics that we can take people through and show them some of the elements in, in traditional gins and our gins and also use those in making drinks. And more recently, we've planted what we think is Australia's only plantation of commercial juniper. Most juniper is wild harvested in the Northern Hemisphere, um, but it'll be nice for us one day to be able to, well, first of all, show people what a juniper bush is and also then make some gin, uh, some gin from our juniper. Um, so as I said, uh, craft distillery is all about c characters. There's always some weird character in the background propping up the bar um, with a crazy idea. And um, we certainly have built our brand mostly organically. Um, it's, we, we just had an intuitive notion years ago that there was going to be this resurgence in gin. That's what directed us as well as the opportunities that gin offered. And also then it just became an organic sort of journey for us in terms of our growth. Our product made its way across to the East Coast. Some cases are getting into Hong Kong. And as I said, we're about to install our second still and, and meet the, the inquiries that we're receiving from overseas. Okay. And like a lot of craft businesses too, I would mention that the business model came behind. So we had a crazy idea for 10 years, but we didn't really have a business model. The business model is something that we're trying to pull together more recently. Okay, collaboration was very important to us. We've been involved in lots of events. Um, uh, Tasting Australia, um, Kangaroo Island Festival, working with other businesses. James Bond visited and had some martinis on the north coast last year and uh, we've had a, um, we started to develop some corporate events. We've done uh, master classes, we've held them in the botanic gardens on occasions and also on the Indian Pacific. Of course, the final summing up of, of our business this year and our major success was that we were able to bring the trophy for best Australian gin home. Um, our old Tom Gin in um, April this year won best Australian gin and so we were able to bring that trophy home, not only to South Australia, but to Kangaroo Island. So Kangaroo Island can now say that South Australia has Australia's best gin and its home is in Kangaroo Island. Um, in terms of other support, lots of family. We've been involved in industry associations like our Food and Wine Association, Tourism Association. In terms of the bank, probably a resounding no. If anyone's in small business, I know that banks have never got much to offer us. We don't pay ourselves enough, so they don't think we can help but we've had a, a crazy good idea and it's worked. Um, the other issues that may be worth mentioning that are a hindrance to us would be the water gap. Um, one of the best things about Kangaroo Island is its remoteness. One of the worst things is its remoteness. So obviously doing business on an island with a big water gap can be an issue. Um, and I will throw in a quick um, reminder that in Australia, we have the highest excise tax in the OECD. So our, figure, our business um, sales went up into the seven figures this year and we had an excise bill of $350,000. Um, unlike most industries, we don't receive any of that back. I mean, we, industries like wine and beer. And a bottle of Australian gin has $25 excise on it. In America, it would attract $3. Um, so that's a, a bit of a biggest hindrance for our business. Um, and the other minor thing, which is a, a, an issue for most small businesses in regional areas, is finding skilled people. Um, so today, 10 years on, we're starting to expand with our second still. Uh, increased capacity tenfold, we employ six to ten local people and two on the mainland um, and we're going strong. So I'll leave it there. Thanks.